because people were looking for a revolutionary change and they, they came to this movement for this. And this language of direct democracy didn't make it possible for us to show what the difference was between our proposals as anarchists and, and the democratic proposals of the parties like Syria. But what happened is actually worse than what I'm describing. Because people who had been looking for you know, a revolutionary change through democracy and, and were uh, unhappy with what happened, some of these people then looked to the far right for democracy. And it turned out that the, uh, the far right could also use this language of democracy to describe what they wanted. So in some parts of Europe now, there are far right nationalist parties that are the ones offering direct democracy and saying that they will bring referendums into the government. And in Brazil, we even heard uh, right wing people using this language, no one represents us. And the, the language of democracy, I think, has also been useful for Bolsonaro. This is a, when we see our enemies using our language to, to, to achieve victories in the social terrain, it gives us the opportunity to analyze our, our discourse and figure out a more effective way to approach the same questions. As long as I've been an anarchist, uh, when I hear people make a criticism of government, the criticism is always that the government is not participatory enough that we should have more uh, influence on what happens. I, I want to propose a different critique. I would say the problem is that, that no institution should be able to rule over anyone. The problem is the, the concentration of legitimacy and force in a single institution. And I think that if we had made this argument from the beginning in the anti-globalization movement, in the Occupy movement, that we would have saved ourselves a lot of trouble. I'll, I'll tell a story now. Imagine a town in which the police uh, killed people on a regular basis, perhaps like Porto Alegre, <laughs> and it's mostly that they kill black people or poor people of color, indigenous people. So of course we, we organize a movement against the police, right? But we want it to be a popular movement. We want many people to understand us. So we describe it as a democratic movement. We want democratic control of the police. You can, you can vote for the mayor, but you can't vote for the police. The police are undemocratic. So imagine that for years we hold protests and we make demands and we say we want democratic control of the police. The police are bad, but we, we should be able to control them. You know, like I was saying before, eventually we, we do win, right? We get a mayor who, who says, okay, we'll give you democratic control of the police. And the, the new government uh, hires German hackers you know, who, who write an app for smartphones you know, so that when the police stop someone, Everyone who has a smartphone can vote in real time for what the police should do. Democratic control of the police. What's, what's the problem with this? Probably you can imagine that in some cities, maybe cities in the south that voted for Bolsonaro, or in the south of the United States where the KKK is still strong, that if we introduced democratic policing, that the police would kill even more people than they do today. And, and this would not be the only problem, because once we had achieved this victory, everyone would believe that the police represented them, that the police were the representatives of the popular will. Even though for the people being killed by the police, it would be exactly the same as if they lived in a dictatorship. And this is a, this is a, a fanciful story, a science fiction story, you know. but it's also the story of how the state survived the end of monarchies and how the, the same institutions of rule, of, of coercive force, continue carrying out the same forms of oppression, even uh, when we have completely democratic control. Okay, so these are some of the problems with democracy. Right? I want to finish by uh, proposing some directions for experimentation away from these problems. We don't have a, a new system that we're here to sell, you know, that, that is like a, with a set of hand signals, a set of rules that they will be better than democracy, we're not doing this. Uh, we have a, a set of, yeah, a set of ideas that we, we want to see people experiment with, basically. The first proposal for experimentation is that we need to develop a, a more robust language of autonomy to, to make a, a popular and a widely understood argument for why autonomy is just as important as horizontality. This is important because in all of the social movements that we've seen, that have been able to pose a real threat to the system. Uh, this has been the result of people taking autonomous actions. It's not usually possible to reach consensus with everyone in the society that it, the right time has arrived to enter into conflict with the authorities. Social change usually begins from independent action. If we had popularized this language of autonomy before the Occupy movement, we would have saved ourselves a lot of trouble. But I, I think it's not enough to just say that we want autonomy. Because autonomy is a very popular concept now with many different people. 
if I understand right, at some point, uh, southern Brazil wanted to have national autonomy. And in the economy now, the, uh, the gig economy, the precarious economy, autonomy is the way that everything works, the Uber drivers, and the, you know, Airbnb. In the United States, there are white nationalists who say that they want to have autonomy also. The meaning of autonomy is, in Greek, answering to one's own law. But this doesn't describe what the relationship is between the autonomous being and the others. We need to, uh, we need to develop uh, oh, an understanding of autonomy where we see our autonomy as depending on everyone else's autonomy. That our freedom begins where others' freedom begins. And we can evaluate our autonomous actions by the extent to which they make it possible for others to act more autonomous. For, for me personally, the word for this is not autonomy, but uh, anarchism. Okay, the second proposal is to create what we call spaces of encounter. A lot of really good things came out of the assemblies of the Occupy movement, but it, it wasn't from the decision making, it was from all of us meeting each other. All these people who are not usually in dialogue could discover what they had in common and discover themselves differently together. Maybe if we had understood that this was what was powerful about the assemblies, we could have done what we were already best at together. We could have focused on this. This is something that we can do in any social movement, in, in any like, window of opportunity, yeah, is to try to create spaces of encounter, also like this space here, which is a different thing than trying to create a government. The third proposal is something we've been calling uh, multiple sites of power. If we go back to my example of the camp and the assembly and the kitchen, the democratic model is to understand the assembly as the site of power, the site of governing, and all decisions should pass through the, the assembly. But from another perspective, we could understand the camp and the kitchen and the assembly as three different sites of power. And to understand all of these as having legitimacy, all of them as being legitimate spaces where, where people can make decisions together. Because if a person can't have their voice heard in one space, maybe there will be another space where they can organize and where they can be on an equal footing with them. This also means shifting the way that we think about organization. Usually, even in social movements, we think about organization uh, in terms of a monolith, like something that is unitary and monolithic. So, for example, in a social movement, there is a single organization or decision-making process that determines everything that happens. And everyone fights to have control of this process or this organization. And usually the point at which one group wins and gets control is the same point at which the movement starts to die. There's a, another way that we could think about what we're doing together in, in movements. That we're trying, to, uh, we're trying to create more space for diversity. And this would mean understanding uh, separating as being just as important of a political practice as coming together. With the idea being that if we separate when we can't agree, but we become like, good at doing this, that could make it easier for us to come back together when we do agree. Finally, the last proposal is uh, about conflict, that we need new forms of conflict resolution. Uh, if there's nothing else we can say in favor of democracy, as a set of practices, I mean, it's that it gives us something to do when we disagree. If we disagree, we have a vote, the majority wins. The, the conflict is not resolved, but it's, it's concluded. The, the result of this is that uh, we, you know, we get rid of the diversity in our movement. If we want to increase diversity, if we don't want to force minorities to become like majority, then we have to have another way of relating ourselves to conflict. As long as I've been an anarchist, we've spent a lot of time talking about how to fight police or break things. Uh, but if we're serious about creating a, a world that is decentralized and horizontal, it's, it seems like it would be just as important to find ways to create the possibility of coexistence between people who don't agree. And probably uh, our ability to fight the state will be determined by our ability to resolve conflicts horizontally. The state will always be better at forcing unity on people. We have to be good at the other thing.